Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, today we're taking a look at predicting the weather, otherwise known as meteorology. Wow, look at how we played off each other right there. You like that? That was really impressive. So what do you think about this? Can we actually predict the weather? <sighs> no, I... I yeah. Wow. I think I think you can to a certain degree, but I think the level of accuracy is like if there was any other job where you could be wrong fifty percent of the time and still get paid to do that job. A batter in baseball, if you're wrong fifty percent, you get out. 50%, well, but that's different. You're that, owning things. That, that's a, basketball. That's a sport. Nah, I'm that talking like if, if you're an engineer and someone says design this and make sure it holds. Make sure your bridge stays standing half the time. Well, I, it might stand tomorrow. It might not stand tomorrow. Right. I mean, any other profession, I feel like the level of accuracy is just really suspect for me. That's fair. So let's take a look back through time a little bit on Ooh. how weather was predicted then. What do you think? I, I like it. Let you me want, hear it. Oh, you want me to head off yeah, with this? I, okay. I like because you're going to give some history, and I know you like your histories. I, I love my histories. How did you know that? done this before huh yeah we've, we've been here okay so weather forecasting began a long time ago in a kingdom far far away uh often relying on like astronomy to try and figure things out so a lot of it was time-based around 650 bc the babylonians tried to predict short-term weather changes based on clouds though so they were getting a little more into things. So, you know, big fluffy clouds, long wispy clouds, things like that. Do you know the name clouds, by the way? Do you know the cat that named the clouds? No. What's his name? His name is Luke. Oh, really? Yeah, I have, wow. it, I have it in a fun fact All here right, a little we'll bit later on. That. But yeah, his, That's the, wonderful. the guy that identified and named all the different clouds, his name That's is That's really Luke. very cool. Good for you, I guess. Thanks. So <laughs> around 340 BC, the uh, Greek philosopher... Go ahead. Oh, Aristotle oh. wrote. I thought you were gonna like like really roll no, off no. Of what I was saying. I thought you were gonna try to pronounce a Greek name. Oh, he wrote a book called Meteorologica. Meteorologica, a philosophical book that had a whole bunch of formulas for rain, clouds, hail, wind, thunder, like all sorts of stuff that it was going to be predicting, as well as hurricanes. So he made some really accurate observations concerning the weather, as well as a whole bunch of really significant errors, where he was just <laughs> just all the wrong. It's uh, nice to know Aristotle was wrong every now and then. Right? Makes me feel better as a person. <laughs> for being wrong most of the time. Yes. Yeah. So the funny thing about it, though, is that his four-volume textbook was actually considered kind of like the gospel for a long time. This is how all weather theory worked for like 2,000 years, even though a whole lot of it was erroneous. So then moving on a little forward in 300 BC, Chinese astronomers had developed a calendar divided into 24 festivals, well, I guess like half months we'll go with, and each one was associated with a different type of weather, which I think that's generally speaking a reasonable way to do it, right? Yeah, I if mean— If you don't have the science and technologies— yeah, I, I think I think most, I would say most old, old, like the kind of old, time, old. In, in the time you're talking, like uh -huh. the BCs. Yeah, the BCs. I, I, I would guess that most of it was, hey, remember this time last year it rained a lot? Yeah. It's probably going to rain. Remember it was really hot this time last year? And then like the Ice Age came and then they're like, what? Oops. Yeah. Didn't see that coming. I, I don't know if that was in like the 300 BCs. I don't know either. But, you <laughs> I'm, know. Just, I'm just guessing. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to say things kind of ended at the end of the Renaissance when people figured out, you know what? We probably need to be more accurate with what we're doing here. You think? What should we do? Make some cool instruments that can measure things like uh, atmospheric pressure, moisture, temperature, things like that. So the first known design in Western civilization for a hygrometer, an instrument that's used to measure humidity, right? Did you know that? No, I did not no. know that's what it was called. It was described by Nicholas Cusa, some German dude, in the mid-15th century. And then Galileo, Italian inventor guy. Um, did we ever do an episode on Galileo? We sh no, we didn't. I we feel should. like, yeah, how have we missed that? Uh. We'll add it to the list. Yes. Great inventors. He invented an early thermometer in 1592, and then shortly after, another Italian, Torricelli, invented the barometer for atmospheric pressure in 1643. Question. 43. When yes, you were answer. in uh, fifth grade, did you make a barometer? I did not. 
So we had this really cool. So basically, you take a coffee can, and if you want to do this experiment at home with your kids, it's kind of fun. So you take a uh, a coffee can, like the old school coffee can. I guess you could use a new school one, but you do a coffee can and you stretch a balloon over the opening of the coffee can, and then you take uh, a drinking straw and you glue it from where the center point is of the balloon on the 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 diam- uh, uh, the center of the the can. You glue it on top on the rubber band. And then you put a toothpick in the end of the straw and glue it there. And then you set it beside like a wall. And as the barometric pressure increases or decreases, the balloon either goes convex or concaved and the toothpick will move as a marker. So you can say, oh, today pressure's pretty good. So that's like zero. And then like when barometric pressure raises, good pressure, good weather's coming. When it lowers, bad weather's coming. So you can kind of predict, you can have a little barometer in your kitchen well, there's some science for you, you never kids. did one of those no now do you so remember doing that or did you do that with your daughter no mr k we did i did that with mr k All in right, fifth mr. grade k. very good yeah teachers listening go do that experiment go Let McClellan us know how it goes. elementary so two fun facts for you you ready shoot the well first in 1495 christopher columbus recorded what might be the first account of a hurricane how about that mm. pretty cool so it's the first one that ever happened well that was documented. I, I know. I'm oh. just messing with you. Second, second fun fact. You ready? Shoot. The Weather Bureau, now known as the National Weather Service, was established on February 9th, 1870 by the 41st U.S. Congress and signed by Ulysses S. Grant. Nice. Yeah, so it's been around a long time. It's been around quite a while. Yeah. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about, I guess... Modern day or could things I talk like that? a little bit more history? Though I thought you had no history. No, no, I do. I I, I just don't have as much as you. Oh, well, so, um, so one of the things, interestingly, that was actually one of considered one of the biggest devices used to help communicate and predict weather was the telegraph. The telegraph. I heard about. And this. here's the reason. So you know, I you're in Cleveland. I'm in Pittsburgh, or you know, Columbus, or well. or whatever it is. And oh, we're speaking hypothetically. Hypothetically, uh. in in Columbus, I, you know, an hour and a half, two, four, six hours later, that same weather that happened there is now going to happen in Pittsburgh, generally speaking. And what happened was they had no easy way before the telegraph to communicate this. I mean, you could only so as the telegraph system throughout the United States expanded, rather than just a telegraph going sixty or eighty miles within a little city. And it started to become a nationwide An 80 mile system. little city? Well, I'm talking like rural telegraph gotcha, systems. Gotcha. Um, now they could use telegraphs to literally communicate you know, across the country in a matter of hours. So you could know, hey, it's really bad in the Midwest. In a couple of days, we're going to get some rain, some snow, some sleet. It's going to be hot, whatever it happens to be. So that's actually considered one of the most significant early on devices with predicting the weather. And that's not really predicting it. It's just like, hey, it's going to rain soon. I think that also helped with understanding weather patterns as well. Like Columbus gets it, but Pittsburgh misses yeah, it. Yeah. So why does the weather travel yeah, in like that the direction? Whole jet stream and all right. that sort of stuff. Uh, another thing, too, is there was a lot of uh, observational stuff that they could do that would actually predict. And the one I love, and I say this all the time, you know me. I say this, James. I know you say I this. I say this. All I know the exactly time. what you're going to say. Red but go sky ahead. night, sailor delight. Red, Red sky, sky morning, morning, sailor fair warning. I wrote faint in my notes. I see that fair warning. And the idea was, I always said take warning. Take. Yes. I thought it was okay. I don't know. I mean, I think it means the same thing. But usually at night, if the sky is red, that means it's going to be a pretty good day on the seas the next day. And if it's red in the morning, it's like, oh, no, we're in for it. We're in for so, it. Watch out. Yeah. So I just thought that was interesting that just based off of the color, and that has all to do with, like, you know, water and the atmosphere and barometric pressure and temperature and humidity. So all That's those things stuff. they could just observe, you know, 24 hours ahead of time and have some accuracy. So I thought that was kind of interesting. The two men credited with the birth of forecasting uh, were two science officers with the Royal Navy. Uh, Francis uh, Beaufort... And his protege, uh, Robert Fritzboy, or Fr- Fr- Fritzboy, Fritzboy. Fritzboy, Fritz Roy. Uh, these were both super influential guys in the British Navy. Uh, and they are considered, again, the ones that actually are kind of the founding fathers of this. Um, 
another fun fact you had some before uh, to convey accurate information uh, it soon became necessary to standardize the vocabulary this is the one oh, we talked about before yeah. of clouds like you're saying fluffy and I would say puffy uh, oh really this was a ch- yeah so you're wrong but that's interesting yeah so what they <laughs> did was they achieved this uh, through classifications in a guy by the name of Luke Howard in 1802, wow. uh, and it's this and it was standardized in the International Cloud Atlas in 1896. How many cloud types are there? I think there's four. Are there four? Five. I thought there were three. Cirrus, Nimbus, Cumulo Nimbus. Cum. cum uh, my science teacher something would like that hate me Earth right space now Earth space science mr henry is, isn't one of your parents a science teacher no okay never mind and they're both retired okay they're too old to actually remember anything at this point and they'll think that you're the one saying this so it's cool <laughs> all <laughs> okay. right well, Moving I, have, on. I have hold on i have more i have more i got okay, so much hurry more up. sorry uh the first ever daily forecast was published uh in the times in August 1st, 1861, the first ever television weather broadcast uh, using maps was done by the BBC in 1936. BBC has played a huge role in a lot of what we've talked These about. These European folks have done quite a bit. Yeah. I feel like the BBC should call us up and we should do a show for the BBC. Hey, boys, looking for a sponsor. I'm telling you. Yeah. Let's take a break before okay. we go any further. How about that? Speaking of sponsors. BBC? Let's hear about it. It is it is not BBC because we just heard about that. But it is, in fact, a shout-out to Ryan K. This is one of my favorite shout-outs. If, if he made fun of me, I'm cutting you off. No, Ryan K okay. is back in the shout-outs. Okay. Why? Why is he back, you say? Because he forgot his own address. <laughs> and when he gave it to me, he gave me the wrong one. So I got my first ever return to sender on our nice. unprofessional engineering stickers. Ryan K., you rock. Yeah, good job. Ryan. Also, JP is back in the news. He uh, sent us an amazing book. I can't even pronounce He's it. He's the president of our fan club, isn't he? Canadianity is the name of the book. If you haven't looked at it, yeah, Canadianity. Well, you didn't bring it in yet. You I gotta... didn't bring it in yet for you. I'm going to read it first. But it's going to help us better understand our neighbors to the north, the snowy north. But yeah, he must be the leader of our fan club. Yeah. Between at him least, and at least the Canadian. Him and Can. Club. Yeah, he's he leads Canada. Cad noobs might lead the okay. U.S. Okay. But yeah, so so thanks, guys. And again, if any of you want shout outs, because why wouldn't you? Or amazing stickers, email us at unprofessional engineering at gmail.com what else should they do Luke I think they should subscribe I think they should definitely give us uh, a review a review there you go you I seem was, to be struggling uh, today. Yeah, I yeah. put you on the spot the, the word review slipped my <laughs> mind for a split second yeah review five stars we don't we don't accept anything less than perfection <laughs> So that's don't give true. us anything less than a five-star <laughs> review. That's funny. Hop on iTunes, wherever you listen. Leave us a review. Yeah, five-star would be great. If yeah. not, tell people why we stink, because, I mean, we do. It's funny sometimes. Yeah, it really is. And make sure you subscribe. All right, moving on. Do you have more history, or can we talk about uh, today? Ba, 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 ba. I think we can go to today. All right. Do you want to lead off with that, or should I? Because I have a lot of science, and it's going to hurt your brain. You do that. I have a little bit of science, and I have some stuff for our listeners about Ooh. the best schools to go to, salaries, if you're thinking about oh, getting boy. into this. And then I have just some fun facts about uh, some other things. I love it. All right, so let's start off with what is meteorology? Do you know what it is? Meteorology is the basic idea of numerical weather prediction to sample the state of fluid at a given time and use equations of fluid dynamics and thermodynamics to estimate the state of fluid at some time in the future. Holy moly. Huh? You just like melted my brain. Memorize that. that. Yeah, you are impressive. Read that. I have it as the study of atmosphere, atmospheric phenomena, and atmospheric effects on our weather oh, mine's a but you know technical, but yours just, is way more technical just, i'm impressed Luke. that's just me <laughs> that is just, just me you. doing me um also weather apparently occurs on different scales of space and time wow that's trippy what do you right? mean so there are four meteorological scales micro scale meso scale sim- sino- synoptic scale man i struggle and global scale so do you want to learn about each of those i'm guessing it's big to little that's little to big, Well, at least in my notes well, and the way I listed so. them. That's true. Yeah. That's a good point. You really do well for being dyslex- dyslexic you. and colorblind and not very smart. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let's All move right. on. Microscale meteorology focuses on a range in size from a few centimeters to a few kilometers and that have a very short lifespan, like one day short lifespan. And so these are very 
small geographic areas, obviously, and the temperatures and terrains in those areas are pretty small and usually rather consistent. I bet you what this would be is like those, uh, some high schools and middle schools and grade schools, they have these little setups or those things in your backyard that give you feedback about your backyard. So there's like a little little propeller thing that has a little barometer yeah, yeah, in yeah. it. I bet that's kind of like a, what did you call it? It's a, a micro scale that's probably a micro tool scale. at least. Yeah. yeah, my guess is that's what like like the backyard stuff and stuff that schools would yeah. do would be well, like that. Well, you're, you're kind of right then because it's often studying uh, processes that happen with respect to soil, vegetation, uh, surface water, like near ground level. And it also has a lot to do with tracking air pollution what? <laughs> Where else would surface water show up? You always make fun of me when I say things like that, but that's all right. Surface water's on ground level. Well, some lakes can get really deep. Okay. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt. Boy. Wow. So we're glad we have Luke here again this week. I think this is three episodes in a row. Ah, mesoscale meteorology. Meso. You ready for that? It's bigger. It is. See, okay. I don't even make fun of you for that. Boy, you hurt me right here. Sorry. No one can see me pointing the, to my heart, but that's where you hurt me, In Luke. the feels. <laughs> in the feels. So this covers a few kilometers to about a 1,000. So apparently there's two phenomenon that happen here, MCC and MCS. Whoa. Mesoscale convective and mesoscale convective systems. All right? So in both of these, large areas of air and moisture is warmed up during the middle of the day. And so like when the sun's at its brightest and so we're at the warmest, right? Oh, look at you up and down. All right. Yep. So the warm air mass rises and into the colder atmosphere. It condenses into clouds, all of those different kinds we were talking about, and turns into water vapor. So an MCC is a single system of clouds that can reach like the size of a state and it makes super heavy rainfall and flooding. MCS is a smaller cluster of thunderstorms that rolls through real quickly just for like an hour or two. And both of them have all sorts of cool physics going on. Next, synoptic scale. Okay, so this is all about the pressure system. So you know when you turn on the weather channel and they're like, we have a low pressure system, we have a high pressure system moving yeah, in, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. So this is what's covering hundred, like hundreds or even thousands of kilometers for high and low pressure systems. So what is a low pressure system, you might ask? I, James, I was wondering what a low pressure system Let was. Let me tell you then, Luke. Thank you for being so inquisitive. Oh, you just like work into this perfectly. Did I, did I make up for my meanness? I mean, it's getting there. So low pressure systems occur when atmospheric pressure at the surface of the Earth is less than the surrounding environment because that's kind of how pressure works, right? So wind and moisture from the area with high pressure is looking for lower systems to move into, right? So the movement causes the system to rotate in a counterclockwise direction in the northern hemisphere. So if you ever look at the radar map, yeah, you always notice yeah, the yeah, storms yeah, yeah. like more often than not are spinning counterclockwise, oh. which is kind of interesting. So it spins that way. It's clockwise in the south. Maybe that's like the toilet water, too. Maybe. Is that true that the toilets go backwards in Australia? Yeah. Is it? You never saw that video where there's like the kid, like he does it for like, you give him a dollar and he shows it to you. He spins water on one side of the equator, wherever the city is, and he, he literally walks 20 feet and does it and it goes no. in the direction. Yeah. Huh. Well, that's pretty cool. So in the southern hemisphere, that happens as well. Um, and this also is what causes cyclones. So all the spinning of the oh, air, it you know, up and... yeah. So even worse, this is what happens when you have hurricanes then. So cyclones over land, hurricanes over water. So the hurricanes are the result of a low pressure system developing over warm tropical waters in the Western hemisphere. And the system sucks up a whole bunch of water and then it dumps all of that water over us in land, mm. flooding stuff and causing all sorts of problems. I, I'm so glad we don't live near a coastal city. Oh, me too. They I mean, always, I'd like to be there, except like for the hurricanes. Yeah, I like visiting. Yeah. It always seems like they get hit by a hurricane right before I visit, though. Yeah. Yeah. So when the winds reach 119 kilometers per hour, which is 74 miles per hour, it's now uh, classified as a hurricane. Interesting. High pressure systems, just a little bit more info here for you. That's kind of the same thing, but that's where the pressure at the surface of the earth is greater than the surrounding environment. And this is what usually causes the extremely cold temperatures as a result of the high pressure systems that develop over the poles and then uh, push, push that cold temp in. Okay. Yeah. How about that? 
So we do have one more, and that's the global scale meteorology. But I'm going to hold off on that while you go through some of your info, because I think some of this is going to match up. Yeah, so uh, the stuff I have specifically about today is there are two. Well, number one, there's a whole bunch of weather models. So, so, so first of all, I love Al Roker. He is my absolute you favorite. You like Al? He's your favorite? Every every morning, me and my daughter watch uh, the Today Show, uh, and Al is the best. Do you remember uh, Joe DiNardo? <sighs> Joe came to our school in a helicopter. See? Yeah, but no one else outside of like us would get that. Uh, Joe but, DiNardo's yeah. the best. Okay, so Al's uh, good too. Yeah, so I love Al. And you always, Joe hear, died. you always hear... What's that? Did Joe die? Yeah. Man, yeah Joe it's too died. bad. Sorry, Joe. Uh, but Al's still around. Uh, so you always <laughs> hear uh, Al Roker and all your other kind of local uh, meteorologists. They always say, oh, this model, that model. And it's actually a, a computer model that's generated that they take all of this data you're probably talking about, uh-huh. all this different local and regional and, you know, uh, st- city, state, all the way up. And they take all this information, they plug it into these models, and that's how they do this predictive weather forecasting. And there's two models. Uh, the first one uh, is, the, is, from the, is the European Center for Mid-Range Weather Forecasting, or the ECMWF just rolls off the tongue. Um, (laughs) And then there's the National Weather Service. So this is in the United States. And this is the Service for Global Forecasting. This is the GFS, which is way easier. Yeah, I like that one. They're more commonly referred to as the European and American model. So every time there's a hurricane, you'll hear Al say the European model shows it hitting here and the American model shows it hitting here. Uh, basically, they do the exact same thing. They have dif- different algorithms. They have different uh, factors that they take into consideration. Uh, but basically, these two models predict weather all over the world. I wonder if one's ever way different than the other. So interesting. Fun fact. Thank you for prompting me, James. So among these global models, the European model has long been uh, considered the most accurate for forecasting Ooh, burn, uh, weather. Uh, on average, so not every time, but they're more right more of the time. If I was going to invest with one, it would be that one. Yeah, Okay. exactly. So famously, uh, they were the ones that more accurately predicted uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, hitting the northwest United States rather than going out to sea back in 2012. Northwest? Northeast. Okay, just sorry. making sure. I Northeast. Got, making sure uh, that's figured out. I looked right at it and said <laughs> west. Um, yeah, so it, so the American model said this thing was going out to sea. Don't worry about it. And the Europeans were like, oh, no, no, no. And Jersey was like, we believe what Europe said. Yeah. Saying. So, uh, but f- also with this fun fact, right after Hurricane Sandy, it was like this big black eye for the National, uh, uh, the National Weather Service. So they actually invested tons and tons and tons of money to basically update their system, change their algorithms to more closely match what the Europeans were doing. I just feel like, why don't you team up? Oh, oh that's Take true. the best of both that's worlds. Right. Just kind of take your yeah, stuff and our might stuff. Might be a bit f- of a sanity check, too. Put it together. So. Well, nothing like a good natural disaster to really yeah. you know, get people make interested you think. again. So before we go on any further, let's take another break for this week's Luke's rant. Okay, so this rant is... 100% related to weather. Absolutely. And we live in Pittsburgh here. We do. And last week, last week, particularly Thursday and Friday, Stephen Cropper, you know who you are. He's a He is our weatherman. He, he's our weatherman for our local news station. You're going to get 8 to 12 inches in Pittsburgh. Literally Getting Thursday, hammered. Friday, it's going to be cold, it's going to be snowy, and like literally everybody and their mother did what happens whenever snow happens. They go out and get their milk, bread, and cigarettes, right? Mm-hmm. And, there's, <laughs> and there's there's literally, like, people are, like, practically hurting each other to get their groceries. And then... Hurting you know, or hurting? Hurting. H-U-R-T. Hurt. They're hurting? Hurt. H-U-R-T? Hurting. Hurting. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, and then, so Saturday, we're all kind of, like, sitting around, like, don't want to go out, don't want to go out. It's going to snow. I'm going to get stuck in the snow. And then it's like... It's 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock. Literally nothing happened other than a little bit of rain. And then Sunday, we got like an inch and a half of snow. And yeah, it, when it was supposed to be over already. Yeah, and it's just it's crazy because like they've been doing this for so long. And there is a huge difference between an inch and a half of snow and 12 inches of snow. I get 
there's a range. Okay, maybe you get two to four. So there's like a two inch variation. But when it's like none to 12 and you get that wrong, this is what I'm talking about. Like, how, I mean, how can you be 12 inches wrong? And right? how can you keep your job when you do this on a pretty regular basis? Now, this was probably the biggest one I can remember where they really botched it. Yeah, they did. Um, but he, he actually took it in stride. He was on camera. Oops. I was watching him on Sunday. And he was like, I'd love to share with you some of the tweets and comments I've received on I'd Facebook. I'd love to hear that. But I can't do that today. It was so He took it in that's stride. That's really funny. Good, so. I, so that's I'm with my you. Rant. That was a good rant, Luke. I liked it. Yeah. Especially because it really hit home. Yeah, it did. Yeah. All right, so let's go back to the global scale meteorology. Shoot. The only thing I want to really say about this is that it's predicting super large weather patterns, right? And an example of that would be something like El Nino, which uh, was is linked to the change in air pressure in the Pacific Ocean known as the Southern Oscillations. So apparently El Nino only happens every five years, give or take, but it's this giant horrible thing that causes extreme weather patterns like extreme rainfall in some areas, killing off fish and everything like that, and it can also cause extreme drought in other areas because it's just messing with everything. But how do they learn to predict these things? It's with all the technologies, right? So some of the big things that they're using now would be radar, which beep, is beep, 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 beep. exactly like that. Well done. <laughs> I didn't know you were so into radar. So it's remote sensing technology for forecasting. You use a radar dish with an active sensor, and it sends out radio waves and bounces off particles. It returns it back. It's kind of like sonar, right? If you listen to our submarine episode. Mm -hmm. Anyways, and it tells it what, what's happening. But now they also have dual polarization radar, which has to be better because it's dual, right? Ours in Pittsburgh is called Viper Radar. Ooh, I, that's way better. That's definitely marketing. Why do you? Yeah, that's definitely marketing. That is amazing, Viper Radar. So it transmits both horizontal and vertical uh, radio wave pulses. And therefore, you know, it's double the flavor, double the fun. You get more so, bright, accurate information. Yeah, back, so you I would get guess. more accurate information. Then the last piece of technology that I want to talk about is satellites, which are extremely important. So NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and NOAA, N-O-A-A, -A, uh, operate three geostationary operational environmental satellites, GOES, because we just need all the acronyms, uh, to provide feedback. So GOES-15 launched in 2010, and it includes solar x-ray imaging that monitors the sun's x-rays for... For, for <laughs> early detection in solar phenomena, such as solar flares, because solar flares can have an adverse effect on both weather as well as things like military and commercial satellites around the globe. Interesting. So they're using, like, all the technologies to predict weather. Yeah. No what kidding. else do you have to talk about? So Luke? I wanted to do this portion for our listeners because I know we have a fairly young audience. Uh, I think and we have some a... that are fairly old. Well, yeah, but... And some that are in the middle. Exactly. Okay. I'm glad we're on, on the same page here. So I want to talk about, like, <laughs> let's let's say this episode inspires you. You're like, you know what? I want to be wrong 50% of the time and get paid for it. Like, that's what I want to do for a living. Hold on. Before you continue, I want to put it out there that not everybody that does this is the weatherman or woman okay. on TV. Okay. There are a lot of people doing a lot of actual science. But they make the more money. Well, this is true. Okay, okay continue. So the best schools for meteorology... And some other things that deal with this. Uh, Texas A&M is number one. University of California, Los Angeles is number two. University of Oklahoma. And Penn State University, main campus, pulling up the number four position. The Pennsylvania State University I, so, represents. So my wife's really involved with higher education. She's mm -hmm. been working at universities for years and years. And she actually, when I said, what do you think the best school is? She's like, oh, Penn State's got to be up there. Yeah. I never they knew that big, they were known yeah. for meteorology. I knew a kid who, who was going for that. Uh, he was actually a roommate of my brother's. And he was not good at school and failed out. And let's be honest undergrad of meteorology isn't always considered the highest level of but, education but could you imagine the test do you think it's going to rain tomorrow 50 <laughs> yes no. 50 percent chance either way you get it either, right <laughs> either way you get it right come on okay so so first of all those are some of the schools <laughs> sorry um but let's say you want to know how much money you're going to make so a broadcast meteorologist. Now, this is no Al Roker. Right, Al Roker's right. making, Al's making bank. He's making some. He's making some coin for sure. But this is probably Stephen Cropper. This is probably your local meteorologist. These cats are making a median salary of eighty-eight thousand dollars a year. Not bad for. Dang. 
again, being wrong 50% of the time. And then the average, so this isn't median, the average for all other meteorologists. So this is you work for one of these agencies and you collect the data and create the models and then you pass it off to someone like Stephen Cropper and then he actually ruins it. Uh, <laughs> these folks make about, so it's not a bad gig. They make 62K a year average and they're just probably more number crunchers than anything and model builders. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I had a little info on that. And it's if you want to go to not be the guy that's on TV or the lady that's on TV telling us about the weather and how it's going to snow and then it doesn't, uh, you, you do usually get a lot of edumacation. You don't normally go for a bachelor's in meteorology. You'll usually go for your four de- four year degree in something like mathematics or engineering or physical science represent. And then it's kind of like a lot of those other sciences like biology and chemistry. They're all, well, not chemistry. We'll go with biology. It's kind of useless mm-hmm. unless you go for your PhD. And so then you use that uh, like math-based, science-based based degree and go on and get your PhD. Gotcha. So it's a lot of years to go predict the weather or at least look at yeah. giant global weather phenomena. So I have one last thing. I have one last thing as well. Go ahead. Do you use the Farmer's Almanac? I, I don't, know. Do you even know what the Farmer's Almanac is? I do, yes. Okay, so Farmer's Almanac, super quick. It's been continuously published since 1818, which wow. is... Bananes. Bananes. Uh, it's crazy. So basically, the Farmer's Almanac, if you haven't ever heard of it before, I'm sure you have. It basically does some weather predictions. Crazy enough, they claim that they are accurate 80 to 85% of the time. That's really good. That's pretty crazy. Though they make broad statements, right? They don't uh, say. Yeah, it's going to be colder today. Uh, but I just thought that was interesting that something like that. Uh, I always look at those woolly bear caterpillars that are brown and black to predict how long winter is going to be. Do you ever do that? I heard if they're really fuzzy, it's going to be Maybe a cold winter. It. Yeah, I don't know. I never actually remember. I have one more thing for you. You Shoot. ready for this? And I think the Farmer's Almanac could be a whole episode, I bet. It could be because they do all kinds of stuff, not just weather prediction. Speaking of things that could be an episode, why don't we always get it right? In the 1960s, of course, an MIT meteorologist named Edward Lorenz came up with a description for this problem. He called it the butterfly effect. Great Aston Kutcher movie. Was it great? I don't know. Oh, okay. (laughs) Referring to how butterflies flapping their wings in Asia could drastically alter the weather in New York City. So this is now, or he's now known as like the father of the chaos theory, which I think the butterfly effect slash chaos theory could be an interesting episode, though I'm not sure I'd understand it all. I'm not that smart. It's the whole bunch of cause and effect stuff happening, I think. Yeah, that's what it is. And I don't know if I really buy into this whole thing, but apparently it works. Yeah, because like if you pass gas, you basically totally negate those butterflies in Asia. Yeah, that's true. So they cancel each other out. That's true. So... Apparently, butterflies can affect our weather. Therefore, that's a get-out-of-jail-free card for all of our weathermen out there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all I had for weather. What about you? Stephen Cropper, I still love you. Oh, that is nice of you. See, we always end with a love on we this do. show. Well, until next time. See ya.